it really is a joy to be with you today. A great joy. And I think that one of the gifts that Our Lady is giving us is a, a deeper share in that joy. Just standing over there, I was thinking, I think the last time that I preached in this church was in the first week of March 2020. And since then, <laughs> we, we have all undergone a great trial. And I suspect that for many of us, it still weighs heavily like a burden. And I think part of the joy of this day is meant to shake off that burden of sadness, of anger, of resentment, so that we can partake richly of the joy of our Lord through the intercession of the Most Blessed Virgin Mary. So I'm praying for that grace for myself, and I encourage all of you, like Father John Paul encouraged us, uh, to pray for a grace today, to pray for a miracle today, to be bold and ask for something beautiful, because the Blessed Virgin in her maternal intercession, in her maternal care, she wants to intercede on your behalf. So we can rely upon that. Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grant us grace, O merciful God, to desire ardently all that is pleasing to thee, to examine it prudently, to acknowledge it truthfully, and to accomplish it perfectly, for the praise and glory of thy name, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Our Lady, seat of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Perhaps you've heard it said that virtue is to be found in the mean. There are various virtues for which this is decidedly the case. So we might think perhaps of courage. That's an especially good one. Courage wends its way between, on the one hand, cowardice, where the soldier flees from battle, overcome by fear, or on the other hand, rashness, where he runs pell-mell into a firefight without determining whether or not it's worth his while. We can think also of temperance. Temperance is a mean between, on the one hand, what we call intemperance or overindulgence, when you see something delicious like Chex Muddy Buddies or like cookie dough, and for whatever reason, your humanity is just overrun by desire, and then the next thing you know, you wake up covered in confectioner sugar. What happened? <laughs> Or on the other hand, insensibility, where we become so stodgy about the goods of this world that we treat them all as sins and hold ourselves off at arm's length, but as a result, alienate the people with whom we're meant to share these good things. So virtue is often enough to be found in the mean. But the question is, does this apply to love? Is love to be found in the mean? Certainly it's possible to love too little, but is it possible to love too much? In the case of God, certainly no. We cannot love God too much because God is infinitely generous with the gift of his love. We are infinitely capacious for the reception thereof and love itself is infinite. But perhaps there's a sense in which we can love others too much. The men and women with whom we live or maybe those who have gone before us Perhaps there's a sense in which the time, the place, the circumstances of the love aren't wholly adjusted, aren't wholly calibrated to the situation, and then maybe it could be said to be excessive. I think many of the objections that we hear to Marian devotion fall along these lines, that it's a kind of inordinate love or a love that obscures the true love. So, Many will say, for instance, that, that devotion to Our Lady is, is overkill. Or they might say that it's idolatrous, a sterner objection still. Or they might say that she upends Christ's place in the Christian life. I want to take this objection as it's articulated and respond to each. So to show an effect that Marian devotion isn't so much overkill as it is overflow of our devotion to Christ that she does not set herself up as an idol so much as an icon, and that she does not upend the place of Christ in the Christian life so much as extend it to us with a motherly care. So we'll take them each in turn. Overkill, idol, upend. <laughs> so those who say that Marian devotion is overkill start with a good intuition. They start with a good sensibility because we're all called 
to a kind of gospel simplicity. Christian life needn't be overly complex. It needn't be overly complicated. St. Uh, Teresa of Calcutta was encouraged by her mother on the day that she left for religious life, the day that she left to enter the Sisters of Loretto, to put your hand in his and follow him alone. It's sound advice. One might say it's the best advice. So there's a kind of worry which arises when we seemingly overcomplicate or when we overcomplexify the Christian life. There's a kind of risk, perhaps, that we lose sight of the one thing necessary. We want to cultivate a devout life which reflects the, the relative importance of things. <laughs> that, that sounds like a sterile way to, to put a very profound point, but <laughs> we want to cultivate a Christian life or a devout life which enshrines different, not doctrines, but realities, Christian realities in their proper place. You can picture perhaps like a, like a big reredos in which there are various niches, and we want to put the right things in the right niches. Otherwise, it might confuse us or it might confuse the faithful. So, for instance, what are the most important things to be said about our Christian life? That God is three in one, that our Lord Jesus Christ took human flesh, period. <laughs> That's in a certain sense enough. And we would do well to cultivate a sensibility of the primacy of the triune God, the primacy of the incarnate Lord in our profession of faith, in our creedal statements, and the way in which it's articulated in the church's teaching. So then, in light of this, how should we cultivate Marian devotion? You don't need me to tell you how to cultivate Marian devotion. You're here. <laughs> Clearly you're here for a reason, and the reason is love. Now, if we worshiped the Blessed Virgin Mary like we worship God, yes, that would certainly be a problem. We don't do that. But, and this might sound scandalous, so I'm a little bit nervous to say it, we do, in a certain sense, Worship Mary, headline of the National Catholic Register. Father Gregory Pine encourages Mary worship. <laughs> okay, so what do I mean by that? What do I mean that, that we worship Mary? How could I dare use this scandalous language? Well, worship taken broadly, or worship as it has traditionally been meant to describe acts of devotion, it just means declaring worthy or showing a certain honor. If you're familiar with old expressions of Anglican marriage vows, I know a favorite theme of all of you here present, um, <laughs> the bride would say to the groom, the groom would say to the bride, I thee worship with my body, right? With no suspicion of, of scandalous devotion. Worship, we know, like if you've watched an oldie timey film in which a magistrate or a justice of the peace was addressed by his subordinate, your worship was a typical way in which to navigate that particular interaction. So in the Catholic tradition then, we distinguish between different kinds of worship. And in general, there are two different kinds of worship. There's the worship of the Most High God, which is just for Him. We think here of words and realities like, like adoration and sacrifice. This is for God alone. God who is our source and our end. God who gives us our life and our acting. God who gives us everything imaginable and who asks of us to refer it back to him. And then, on the other hand, we have the kind of worship which we call veneration or honor. And this, like in the ancient tradition, in the pagan tradition, would be the type of honor that you would extend to heroes, to warriors, to great athletes. But something that we extend in the Christian dispensation to the saints, to holy persons. And we have this difference marked out for us in the way in which we pray. So if you've ever said a litany, for instance, I'm thinking here of the Dominican sisters who pray, pray a litany to St. Dominic each day at the middle of their, their prayer schedule. Uh, you ask the Most High God to have mercy on us. You ask the saints and angels to pray for us. And we don't cross those lines. We don't confuse those realities because it pertains to God by right to have mercy with a creative and redeeming love, and it pertains to the saints to pray for us. So, okay, Father Gregory, you have successfully avoided the scandal which you introduced but five minutes ago, or at least I hope I have. <laughs> right now, okay, that being said, the worship of God seems plenty sufficient. 
The worship of God should be enough to tide us over, right? So why, why bother with all these extra things when they could distract from the one thing necessary, when they might represent a kind of overkill? Well, because God is wonderful in his saints. God is glorious in his saints. God is manifest and communicable in his saints. Because God is not content to constrain his glory to his own interior life, but he expends himself in the dispensation of creation and recreation, bestowing a share in that life in those whom he draws close to him, in his beloved saints. So we profess that in this time, we live under a new law. And the new law is just the grace of the Holy Spirit poured into our hearts, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, that we are incorporated into Trinitarian communion. We are made to abide in the very household of God and that that changes us. It's not just something tacked on. It's not just something that's meant to paper over. It's meant to be poured into our interior life so as to genuinely renovate it, so as to make us good, so as to heal us and grow us beyond the bounds of our present trial, beyond the bounds of our present sorrow, which is awesome. And that merits a certain veneration that is honorable, that is worthy of respect. And so, God's goodness is evident in the goodness of created things. I think here of a line from the poem, uh, or a poet, Gerard Manley Hopkins, who says, for Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes not his, to the Father through the features of men's faces. Never has there been testimony of the glory of God so manifest and so communicable among the sons of Adam and daughters of Eve as in the Blessed Virgin Mary. If we say that God is made glorious in his saints, then that is true above all of she who is most excellently and manifestly united to, conformed to her son. So veneration and the, the desire to express a certain intercession are entirely appropriate insofar as they have made known in their lives the glory of God. They have amassed certain merits by God's choice, and so they can apply those merits throughout the course of our lives because God has deigned it good, because God has chosen it to be so. So then, overkill? No. Overflow? Yes. God's love overflows the bounds of his divine life, spills forth into the life of his saints so that we might see how glorious he is, so that by reference to them, they, we might be referred to him and be blessed in turn. So that's the first. Second. <laughs> idol? No. More like an icon. What do we mean by, by an idol? An idol would be something other than God that draws worship to himself or itself and away from the true God. So it's false. It, it's pretending or claiming to be something that it is not. Whereas an icon is perhaps an image, perhaps an individual that channels worship to God, that is transparent to the working of God. And this is a difficult thing for us to grasp. It's difficult for a variety of reasons. Because I think in our own human experience, it's hard to get out of our own way sometimes. And there are various places in which this crops up. Think about maybe when you made an effort to perform some charitable deed you know, some good work. And then let's say that uh, you received a compliment. What did you say in return? Yeah, what, what are you supposed to say? Like, glory be to God, or thank you, or it wasn't me, or maybe it was, or I don't actually know how to respond, but I feel somehow awkward by or cheapened by this whole experience. It's, it's tough. It's really tough. And insofar as we obsess over it, or insofar as we overthink the whole experience, it becomes more complicated still. We just wish that we could melt into the floor and never have to respond to a compliment. But that's not the point of human life. <laughs> the point of human life is to feel slightly awkward up until the moment that you die. <laughs> because God intends it for our healing and our growth. <laughs> so we find it difficult to get out of our own way. And in trying not to make a thing out of it, we often end up making a thing out of it. But it is possible, and we have seen it happen, that it is possible to genuinely forget yourself 
Forget yourself in a healthy way. Forget yourself in a wonderful way. And then come to discover in turn that the plans of God pass through you, that they work through you, that they have implicated you. So in these situations, what we come to discover is that our personality needn't hinder the working of God. Truth be told, our personality can actually facilitate the working of God. That we can, by his grace, go up to the mountaintop, behold him with faces unveiled, and then come down to our brothers and sisters with the testimony impressed upon our visage that we worship a living God, that he is not dead, he is alive, he is risen from the grave, and he continues to pursue each of us until we draw our last breath. We can make that known in our humanity. We can actually give God to our brothers and sisters, not just interesting tidbits that we learned about God or cool little tricks which might help us to discover God. We can give God. That's not a boast. That's not proud to say. That's humbling to say. That's almost mortifying to say. To be entrusted with such a gift that needn't be a burden, but can be a source of freedom. That in getting out of our own way, we come to discover that God has passed our way. So there are many aspects of the life of the Blessed Virgin Mary that seemingly draw our attention. Many aspects of devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary which would seem to fall afoul of this accusation of idolatry. We hear it said, or I have said already many times, I'm quoting myself, <laughs> that Our Lady is among the greatest works of God, that she, she shows forth an exceedingly high dignity from an exceedingly high grace. In his big book of theology, St. Thomas Aquinas has this little hidden gem, all right? It comes when you would least expect it. He's asking a question that would interest 18th and 19th century philosophers about whether or not this world is the best possible world. And in consummate Thomistic fashion, he says, no, it's not the best possible world. Are you kidding? Not a chance. Because God can always improve upon what he has done. But then he sneaks in right at the end that there are three things upon which God cannot improve. The reason for which is that these three things enjoy such sublime and intimate union with God that you can't get anything else in between. There's not even a crack, not even, not even a sliver. The union, the, 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 the intimacy is so perfect that we can't imagine any way in which it can be improved upon. Now the first will come as no surprise. The sacred humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ, which shows forth a quasi-infinite grace, which is kitted out or equipped with every imaginable virtue, gift of the Holy Spirit, fruit of the Spirit, and beatitude, which is the fontal source of the life of grace for all Christians. And you might think to yourself, right, obviously. Now tell me the other two. <laughs> Gladly, it is for this that I have come into the world. Okay. <laughs> The second is what St. Thomas calls created beatitude and what we can simply call our sharing in the life of heaven. What we await in heaven is not like a, okay, you sit in the waiting room and when God has time, he'll get to you. No, in heaven, you will be wed to God. We read in the gospels that you will neither be married nor given in marriage, right? And, and sometimes couples will fear that. What might that mean if I'm not with him or if I'm not with her? Don't worry about that. It's not as if at the gates of heaven, God separates husbands and wives. You will still have a very wonderful union in heaven. But what it does mean is that in heaven, there will be no mediation. And recall, the sacrament of marriage is a sacrament, which is to say that it's a sign. And there are no need for signs when you abide in the reality. There is no need to be referred further when you are at the end. And so our sharing in the life of God in heaven is, as it were, being wed to God, being united to God in most perfect and excellent fashion. Again, something upon which we cannot improve. Okay, that's two. This is a talk about the Blessed Virgin Mary and I haven't mentioned her, so you know exactly where this is going. So he says the third thing is Our Lady, Our Lady. Because after the grace is accorded to Christ, the next highest graces are accorded to her. That after the grace of union, the grace of the hypostatic union, the grace of the incarnation, the next greatest imaginable grace is the grace of the divine maternity. 
that Our Lady bore Our Lord in her womb and in her heart. So, okay, Father Gregory, I thought you said you're trying to defend against the accusation that Our Lady is an idol, and now you have just heaped praise upon her. You have just extolled her to the heavens. How are you going to extricate yourself from this difficulty? Another excellent question. Here we go. <laughs> so one thing that we see in the life of the Blessed Virgin Mary is that not despite, but in the midst of these exalted graces, in the midst of these exalted graces, she manages to disappear. Even with these exalted graces, what comes forth most powerfully and forcefully are the graces of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we can think of the graces of her life, which we enshrine in various dogmas, the Immaculate Conception, the fact that, as George Bernano said, Mary is younger than sin, or her perpetual virginity, that she is kept pure and spotless by her bridegroom God, or her assumption that God does not permit his beloved to know corruption. It's incredible. The graces accorded to her which follow upon the divine maternity or prepare for the divine maternity are incredible. And yet, in her life and in her ministry, we see that she, practically speaking, disappears, always promoting our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you can think of this disappearing act at various points in the gospel. Perhaps, you know, at the Annunciation, when we hear those words from her lips that, may it be done unto me according to thy word, or in the public ministry, that she ceases to speak after the second chapter of the Gospel of John, and that she's unattended despite her expressed desires to visit with our Lord. But I think that we see it most evidently in the Lord's passion and in its unfolding. So it starts at Cana, in that Our Lady asks of our Lord a sign. But when you ask for the first sign, in turn, you ask for the final sign. In asking him to embark upon his public ministry, she asks him to embark upon a pilgrimage which ends at Calvary. And yet she does not hesitate. They have no wine. Do whatever he tells you. In that, we find a kind of first embrace of what he calls in the Gospel of John his hour, as our Lord proceeds through the Gospel on his way to the hill on which he will suffer and die. We see it most especially in the 12th chapter of the Gospel of John when we hear that conversation between the Lord and the Father where he says, Behold, my soul is troubled now. What shall I say? Father, deliver me from this hour? No, for it was for this hour that I was born, that I have come. Father, glorify thy name. So Our Lady's yes at the miracle of the wedding feast of Cana becomes a kind of icon through which we are prepared and through which we can appreciate our Lord's yes throughout the whole course of his life, but most especially at the threshold of his passion. Our Lady is conformed to him, and her graces give us an insight into his graces. What begins at Cana ends at the foot of the cross, where we find Our Lady standing. We refer to her as the Stabat Mater, or we refer to that posture or that stance as the fact that Our Lady stood, which for Dominicans is a very important thing, a very precious thing that we've preached like since forever. <laughs> because there was a devotion going abroad in the 13th through the 15th century, Our Lady of the Swoon. Perhaps you've heard this. In sacred art, sometimes you'll see Our Lady posed in very Baroque fashion, like, right, as if it were entirely too much for her. And devotion to this was cultivated throughout the high and late Middle Ages. But Dominicans, time and time again, and most especially Car Cardinal Cajetan, preached against this. Because Our Lady does not swoon. Our Lady stands. Our Lady's heart, having been conformed to the heart of her son, is made adamantine. And there are no trials, there are no sorrows which can overcome her. Because in him and in her, we have the source and the testimony that this life is possible. She reveals to us the graces accorded to her son and the graces which issue from her son into our lives. Our Lady is conformed to our Lord in his life and in his death. So like a good icon, Our Lady disappears as our gaze passes through her 
and unto him. She reveals well the mystery which lies at the core of her being. She puts her son in better relief. She is the one in whom and through whom we behold our redemption, a window unto heaven, not an idol, but an icon. All right, third and finally, upend? No, more like extend. Christ, we know, is the sole mediator of salvation. He needs no help from us. He needs no addition from us. The letter to the Hebrews rules that out. The tradition has testified to this fact from time immemorial. Our Lord does not stand in need of further mediators. I think we have difficulty understanding mediation in general, in part because of how sunk we are in matter. Because whenever we think about mediation in this material world, we think about it as a kind of competitive thing. We think like, okay, if you're getting this much from her, then you're getting this much less from him. But I don't think we need to struggle with it in this way because Christ employs other means or he employs other mediations, like we have said, not because he needs them, but because he loves us. Not because he needs them, but because he loves us. Christ employs other mediators because it's beautiful, because we are healed and grown thereby. Christ wants to see to it that we are compassed about on every side by realities which testify to he who is at the heart of reality. Christ wants to fill every register of our human experience with goodness, a goodness that mediates his goodness, that testifies to his goodness, which ultimately draws us back into that same goodness. So we experience this kind of extension of his incarnate mediation in practically every facet of our human life. The church, the church for one, that Christ, knowing that he would ascend to the Father, gave us the spirit and instituted the church in which we would have the assurance that we can encounter his presence, that we can encounter his mercy, such that when you go to the mass, you know that if the words are said with the faith of the church, that our Lord is present on the altar and that you can partake of his body, blood, soul, and divinity and be nourished thereby, that you can grow in the life of grace, that you can have kindled within your heart a deeper charity, that you can proceed on the way further up and further into the divine life. Because the church is a home in which God gives good things to his sons and daughters. Or like the sacrament of confession. So today between 11 and 2, I think that's right, we're going to have confession available in various places in the shrine, right? And, and in that opportunity, you can confess your sins and know again that if Father intends with the faith of the church and says the right words, that they are forgiven. You don't need to rack your brain with scrupulosity or to run over old ground with terror. You can have peace flood your soul because God has given us a church in which abide the sacraments, wherein we have certainty and confidence that his love is mediated. Not because he lacks. He could do it immediately. He could do it without any help. And yet he has chosen these means which are closer to our experience, which take hold of us with a kind of tender care, which conduct us with a gentle solicitude unto the mystery itself. Or you think about like preaching. God could zap the knowledge of him and of his mysteries directly into your mind if he saw fit to do so. But instead, he intends that it be communicated to you by friends, by family, by the hierarchy of the church, one who holds your gaze and who can communicate to you the reality of the gospel with genuine love. Not that you would lack for that if Christ were to do it directly, but now you get that. You get that in the church as something more, as something which, which gives a human face, which gives a human feel to the love of God. You can think of your own life. Think of your own life. You are 100% the fruit of God's love. 100%. But here's the mysterious thing. You are also 100% the fruit of your parents' love. Those claims are not intention. They are not contradictory. 
God is completely content to add 100% to 100% to 100% to 100% so that you might know the joint testimony of potentially infinite 100% that you are loved. So that in the recognition and reception of that fact, you can return to him in love, by love, for love. We can know the love of God. We can know it. We can know it as surely as we can know the church, as we can know the sacraments, as we can know the preaching, as we can know our parents. We can know the love of God, and as a result of which, we can lay hold of it. And I think that in the Blessed Virgin Mary, we have a peculiar grace, namely that she mediates the love of God to us with the love of a mother. She mediates the love of God to us with the love of a mother. And for many of us, we don't need explanation as to what that means. The love of a mother is closer to us than our own thoughts in many cases. The love of mother is like, it's like the ground floor. It's like you can't get below it. It just bears you up. It supports you. It carries you. It sustains you. You know that come what may, regardless of what befalls, that you will be loved by this woman and that that is good. And it imparts to you a certain courage to continue to live your life. I think of, yeah, just like the mere fact that there is a person in the world who loved you sufficiently to bring you to term, right? To give you life. That is a huge cosmic affirmation that you are good, that God has a plan for your life, that that plan will come to successful issue, even if that plan is modest, even if that plan is humble, even if that plan is hidden. Yet that plan is good. And we know that through the love of a mother. A mother, she, she makes it possible for us to explore in a certain sense, that we can go near or far, and we know that there's somebody waiting for us at home. She's probably, if it's a cold day, she's probably preparing like tomato soup and grilled cheese. <laughs> at least she did for me. All right, I'm going to tell a story about my mother, and I'm not confusing my mother with the Blessed Mother. <laughs> uh, it might sound like that for a second, but then you'll see that it doesn't mean that. But just hang on, okay? You're like, I thought the idolatry piece was point number two. Okay. Um, so I like to go hiking, and I lived for the past three years in a country in which it's very wonderful to go hiking. And I went hiking in, in late November, uh, which in this place, it's Switzerland. I don't know why I'm being coy about it. It's like, don't tell them that you went to Switzerland. Uh, weird. Okay, so I was in Switzerland, and I was hiking in late November. Um, and in the mountains in Switzerland, there are two seasons. And there's winter and, like, July 7th. You know, so it's just, it's just, it's just always winter, devastatingly winter. And, and I was going to a particular region uh, just south of where I lived called Valais, in which there are beautiful valleys. Didn't see that coming. And, and I went to a little town called, called Fionnet, and I was planning to hike to the top of a mountain called the Becca de Courbazier, and then to hike back and out, and then return home, you know, with sufficient time to get ready for prayers and to live my calm and serene life. <laughs> You see where this is going. Oh, no. Okay, well, things started off bad, and then they got worse. So I forgot, for one, my snowshoes, um, which you might think, snowshoes? No one uses snowshoes. Um, well, in this country, you must, or with every footfall, you plunge deep into the snow, and you don't advance, and you imperil your life, which I'd like to say that I don't want to imperil my life, but the frequency with which I imperil my life seems to suggest otherwise. So. I forgot snowshoes. I realized this like 25 minutes into my little car ride, and I said to myself, this will be fine, not worth it, and <laughs> famous last words, uh, except for these words, which I guess, never mind. Okay, so um, I arrived at my trailhead, and I got to hiking, and fortunately, I was in the sunny side of the mountain for the whole morning, and it was quite wonderful. Um, so I, I mounted my way up that particular slope. I was actually hiking next to a glacier for a while, which was beautiful and terrible. I didn't see another soul the entire time because the people of Switzerland, being prudent people, don't do stupid things. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I do, all right? So, so I got to the top of this mountain, uh, or I got to the saddle between that mountain and another mountain through which I was meant to pass and then descend into my valley in which I was parked. And, and in that moment, a, very, or a variety of things happened. Um, and those things changed the next several hours of my life. So, for one, it was super windy, um, and with the wind chill, it got super, super cold. 
such that it like shock froze everything on my person, like my eyes, my nose, and then the hose of my hydration bladder, which you haven't seen it, it's like a water bottle for the lazy. So it has like a little thing here that you can dispense water from. But then the hose is frozen, so I still have water in my pack, but if I'm going to drink from it, then I need to remove it from my pack and then take it manually every time, which is exhausting. And if there's one thing that's true about me, it's that I am impatient and I'm not going to do things that slow me down, which is for my undoing, as you will see. Um, so that happened. And then I lost service on my phone, which ordinarily isn't that big of a deal, except that I'm a millennial and my whole life is on my phone. And then without it, I, I'm basically fit to curl up in a ball, suck my thumb, and hope for morning. Um, so I had failed to download the map. I had failed to download the map for this particular hike such that I could use it for GPS location. So I had a still frame of the map that I ought to have been following, but it wasn't updating. And I also found that I was now on the not sunny side of the mountain, which is to say the shady side of the mountain. And I also found where all of the snow in the entire valley had been accumulating. <laughs> Which is great, which was great. Um, so as you might imagine, I had great difficulty following the signs, following the trail markers, which were meant to get me off that mountain, which at this point was basically a kind of slopey cliff. So there were points at which you could descend into the valley, but they were few and particular, because if you just tried to rollick your way down, it would not go well. It would go very, very poorly. So I was trying to follow the signs, but they were all covered with snow and I was not having much success. So I know some survival skills because if you imperil your life with bewildering frequency, then you ought to learn at least a couple. And so I was making my way up and down, kind of what I knew to be the trail and trying to interpolate rather than extrapolate because that usually puts you in an even worse situation. But being on the edge of a very steep incline, I just kept coming up against cliff faces, which was not good. So I was starting to get dehydrated because I wasn't taking enough water or I wasn't taking it sufficiently. And the, the very taste of food was cloying, and uh, it was just death dealing. And so I didn't want to eat, and I was trying to force myself to eat, but I was getting really tired, and I was getting really loopy, and I was getting really sad, and I was getting really angry. And then I started to hear avalanches, <laughs> which is just what you want at that stage of the game. Because if being lost in the mountains isn't sufficient, the, the snow coming for you, that makes it all the better. So at that point, I was still trying to listen to an audiobook, thus I could derive further pressure from life because I was multitasking my little way along. So I turned off my audiobook as I leapt behind a rock for fear of my life. Uh, because, well, for one, my heart was pounding too fast for me to hear the words of it anymore. So at this point, it's getting to uh, a little bit of a late hour in the afternoon, and I would like kind of started uh, this particular part of the journey around 1 p.m. and we're on towards like 2, 2.15, 2.30. And the valley's gonna go dark at 4.30 and I don't wanna be up there. I'm at 2,800 meters, which is like 9,000 feet and change. And I need to get down to like 13 or 1,400 meters. So I've got a lot of way to go. And I haven't made any progress in the last hour, of a, hour and a half. And then the fog started to roll in, which if you've ever experienced fog in the Swiss Alps, it has this wonderful characteristic to it because if there's snow on the ground and fog in the air, you can't actually see where the ground stops and where the sky starts. It's, it's awesome, it's like being swaddled, which is to say smothered in a white blanket. So I'm seeing rank after rank of distant mountains disappear. And that's terrifying because if I'm having trouble now, there's no chance of me having any success later. So all throughout this experience, even whilst listening to my audiobook, I had been praying to the Lord to just, to just get me out, to supply me with the means to, at the very least, survive. And evidently, the Lord hadn't been doing anything or hadn't been doing anything that I could register as a response. But at that moment, as I saw the fog coming for me, I had a thought, something that hadn't occurred to me previously, namely that I could pray to my mother. So I had been lost previously in the mountains at the age of 19 in the mountains of New Hampshire at this particular juncture. Actually, I've been lost in the mountains plenty of times, but this one was the worst one. And, and there was one point while I was lost where I had, briefly, I had cell phone service and I called search and rescue, which ultimately is what saved me. And, and I could at that moment have called my family, but I decided not to because I knew that they just worry and that they couldn't do anything. So it didn't seem like there was much sense. And it was like kind of dramatic at that stage to say like, goodbye. Um, so I, I held off. 
Eventually, I did meet up with my family in the emergency room in a random hospital in North Jersey, but that's for another day. <laughs> All right, so back to the present. Here, though, the situation was different than it had been when I was 19 in New Hampshire. All right, so because, you know, since my last hiking misadventure, my mother had passed away, and so her stance towards my safety was different. Namely, she already knew about it, and she wasn't worried, and she could do something. I only had to ask. And so I prayed to my mom to get me off the mountain. Within seconds of finishing my prayer, I saw a trail marker that I hadn't seen for the past hour and a half, and it was headed in the right direction. I approached the trail marker, and then from the vantage of that trail marker, I saw the trail. I knew it was the trail because there were footprints on it, human footprints, footprints of someone working his way up or her way up from the valley floor. And the thing that was wild about the footprints is that they stopped there. They stopped at that trail marker. They stopped at me. I followed those footprints off the mountain and I hit the valley floor just as the lights were coming on in the village. What am I to make of that? Am I to make of that that Christ didn't hear me for my first hour and a half and my mother heard me in the last five seconds? No, not in the least. Christ answered my prayer, both in not responding and in responding through my mother's intercession so that I could experience his love through her love. I could experience his love, the depths of his love through her love. Our devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary is like this. It doesn't upend devotion to Christ. It extends it. Because regardless of the relationship that you have with your earthly mother, whether it be good or ill, you have a relationship with a heavenly mother who cares for you beyond imagining and who is poised to bestow on you all the glory of God such that you can experience the love of her son through her own. She doesn't supply for a lack in the Most High God. Rather, she extends his love with the love of a mother. And there is no love so tender. So, we return then to our question. Whether virtue is in the mean. But I think in the case of love, it's just not possible to love too much. Not only God, but the gifts of God, which can be had in union with God provided that they are loved at the right time and in the right place and that we appeal in the right way, we needn't fear overkill, for it is in fact overflow. We needn't fear idolatry, for it is in fact an icon. We needn't fear upending when God is in fact extending his love. God gives us the Blessed Virgin Mary for the perfection of his saving work in us. She, who is the overflow of divine goodness, who is the luminous icon of the divine plan, who is the sweet, sweet extension of divine love. Our blessed lady, queen of our hearts, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs>